Hello everyone, so my name's Dr Amanda Owen and I'm from the University of Glasgow where I'm a lecturer. I study both modern and ancient river systems and I would like to talk to you today about paleoclimate and rivers. More specifically, what can the rocks tell us about how rivers respond to large-scale climate events? So the first thing we should probably quickly talk about is how rivers actually become rocks. Now we have areas of uplift, which we're going to call mountains, and we have areas of subsidence, which I'm going to call basins. And now tectonic processes are fundamental in controlling where we have these different areas. So for example, we have the Indian plate colliding with the Eurasian plate. We have thrust tectonics with rocks being thrust on top of each other, and this forms our nice mountainous areas. But due to uh, flexure and loading on the plates, and sometimes where the plates are being pulled apart, we have areas of active subsidence. Now, rivers will erode those mountainous areas, they will transport that material and de ultimately deposit in the sedimentary basins. Now, material build up through time, it will become buried, and that's when it becomes lithified to then form rocks. So let's just look at the actual mechanics of that. So we've got a meandering river system here. I'm just going to play that animation. If you look in here, we can see that river actually cuts itself off when we form a meander bend cut off. And we actually leave behind the deposits of that previous channel there. We can also see another relict one here. We're also going to get through time that river flood and supply material to the floodplain. So what we end up with, as this diagram shows, is this river system migrating, depositing material, and then we have flood events, depositing the mud, and we build that stratigraphy through time. So what we can do is go and study the deposits of that stratigraphy in relation to climate events. Now, we importantly have to identify where those climate events are, which we will do in our case study example, but we can then see and compare the river system, how it behaves before, during, and after that event. So the Paleocene Eocene Thermal Maximum uh, records a pretty drastic climate event that happened about 56 million years ago. So just to kind of uh, give you a little bit of context, we have on this graph, we have age of millions of years, zero, so this is present day, down to 70 million years. Now, there's a lot going on, but I'd just like you to concentrate on the temperature curve down here in red. And we can see from about uh, the record we have here, we can see the temperature fluctuates through time. But importantly, we see a really drastic sharp shift in the temperature through this negative carbon isotope curve about 56 million years ago. And this is because we had a really rapid release of carbon, which took about 20,000 years to release. On the whole, the event, the Paleocene Eocene Thermal Maximum, lasted about 200,000 years. Now, globally, temperatures rose by about 5 degrees C during the Paleocene Eocene Thermal Maximum. I'm just going to shorten that to PTM from now on so I don't get tongue tied. So let's go and have a look at the Paleocene Eocene Thermal Maximum. So the location we're going to go and have a case study example from is the Bighorn Basin. And this is situated on the border um, between Montana and Wyoming. So we're up in the northwestern corner of the USA. Now, during the Paleocene, Eocene, so about 56 million years ago, we had collisional tectonics happening here. So we were having um, rocks being thrust on top of each other to form areas of uplift. And these areas are the Beartooth Mountains, the Owl Creek Mountains, and the Bighorn Mountains over in the east. Now, this is where we had areas of uplift, and in between these, we had subsidence. So that's where our sedimentary basin is. So we had rivers coming from the Bighorn Mountains, from the Owl Creek Mountains, and the Beartooth Mountains, delivering sediment into the centre of that basin. And that's the sediment that we're going to go and analyse. So what specifically changed in the Bighorn Basin during the PTM? So this table here summarises uh, all the kind of literature that's been undertaken and studies undertaken in this basin. So we've got pre-PTM, PTM and post-PTM. Now the mean annual precipitation, we can see that vastly decreases during the PTM and then recovers to normal conditions afterwards. The mean annual temperature, we can see, like we saw globally, we can see a five degree increase in temperature. But again, after the PTM, it returns to normal conditions. We also see a change in the vegetation type. So we go from conifers to dicots and then back to conifers. Also, the vegetation density changes. So we, we go from quite a dense um, mosaic landscape to relatively open uh, vegetated landscape. But then again, back to dense during, uh, after the PTM. The other thing we see, which paleontologists have picked up on, is dwarfing of animals. 
Um, so this is a, a sketch um, to show a modern horse and the expected size of horses uh, during this time period. But we actually saw during the PETM that these horses dwarfed by about 19% in size. So there was a clear impact on the climate on certain aspects of the environment. But what we're going to go and look at is how significant are these changes in terms of modifying our fluvial system, our river system behaviour. So the first site we're going to look at is a place called Polcat Bench. And scientists here have looked at the deposits and we have the carbon isotope curve from here. So we know exactly where that climate event is. So we can look at the deposits before, during and after that event. Now, we as sedimentologists, we create something called a sedimentary log. And that basically means we go up through this stratigraphy, so those layers of rocks, and record information. So, for example, we record what the environment was, whether it was floodplain or, or river channels. We record important things like what's the grain size of the sediments, because that can tell us about the dynamics of the river system. So, for example, larger grains are going to need much higher flow velocities than smaller grains. We can also record information, for example, uh, the colour of the rock. So we can see in here, even though it wasn't a particularly nice day that we went here, uh, hence the grey photograph, but we can see some rocks are red and some are grey. So this is a very simplified sedimentary log here. And this red line here, that re represents pre-PTM. This is the PTM info here, and this is post-PETM. And the colours in here represent the colours of the paleosols, which are basically ancient soil deposits. So we're looking at ancient floodplain. An important thing to understand about um, paleosols is just like modern soils, we have certain soils forming in certain environments and certain climates. So grey soils represent very um, kind of waterlogged conditions, very wet, whereas red soils represent uh, quite dry conditions where we have oxidation happening. That's what gives it that red colour. So I think we can all see at this site here, we have grey rocks, uh, grey paleosols. And then during the PETM, the rocks become a bit more red. And then again, although we still see some red rocks, we don't see that dominance of the red paleosols after the PETM. That kind of indicates to us, um, which uh, researchers, uh, Mary Krauss had done, is that the, the soils became maturer and thicker and more red during that climate event, which matches with what we expect with the temperatures which we get from isotope data. However, there are certain things that don't quite um, add up here. So that sedimentary log, another one was constructed hundreds of metres away, but we don't see the same trends even if we just walk 100 metres away. And this is that sedimentary log here. So the yellow bit here, that re represents uh, river channel deposits. So we can see the difference here is this is where the river was during the time period. Over in this section, that's just floodplain dominated, whereas over here we have a few um, river channels present. And yes, we do start to see those red deposits come through, but we can also see them before and after. So this log doesn't actually give us any indication. We do see channels present during that period, but we also see channels above and below it. We then constructed another sedimentary log ourselves, another few hundred metres away. And again, we can see these river deposits as we go up through time, through those um, layers of rocks. Again, we can see where the onset is because we have the geochemical data. But again, we're not seeing any kind of big, massive changes. And something that's really critical here is we only actually looked 20 metres below and about 20 metres above. In this basin, we have hundreds of metres to kilometres of sediment. So that's the first thing that we kind of need to be careful of is, yes, we can look at the context of that PETM event, but how far above and below do we need to compare to understand what the normal conditions were? Then go over to Saddle Mountain, a new site, and a researcher here um, records the presence of a really thick channel body here, so deposits of uh, river channels on top of each other. And they said it actually got to a kind of record thickness, 35 metres thick. Now, if you compare that deposit to pre and post PETM channels, um, the authors recognise that the PETM interval, they had a much larger scale river system. Now, if we think back to um, possibly uh, at the previous site, that's where we actually saw uh, 
the river floodplains become much more mature and much more kind of prevalent and thicker and, and hotter. So it, it's quite hard to explain how in another area, a few kilometers away, that we have this really big river channel come through. But an important thing is, is internally, the characteristics of the system didn't change, which the authors picked up. There was no change in the paleo flow depths. There was no change in the widths of the channels. And there's no change in the sediment characteristics of, for example, grain size. So this, again, starts to make us think about, well, how much did that river change? All we have here is just more deposits on top of each other. We also constructed a sedimentary log and we actually found that the river channel actually changes in thickness quite considerably. So this is a question is, where do you take your data point from? And this is the importance of doing these really large scale studies to gain that picture. We shouldn't ever base our interpretations on one data point. We should look at multiple data points and see what's happening. And this is actually uh, demonstrated at the next site very well. So at Sand Creek Divide, our final stop, Again, um, authors noted that there was a similar trend seen at Polecat Bench, where we had much more red and mature soils during this climate event, which in here is just in there. However, the authors noted, and it's something that we noted with our data as well, is if you trace that red layer, those nice thick deposits uh, during that climate event, they actually change into grey deposits, even though we're in exactly the same time period. And this, this makes sense when you actually think about it, because if we, we stood on our modern landscape and we walk across a floodplain, the dynamics and the characteristics of that floodplain change in space. And that's exactly what's being recorded here at these sites. We're not seeing the same changes happening all at once because our environment is extremely dynamic. We can walk from a river channel over onto very wet, proximal, very close to the channel floodplain, it's very distal far away floodplain and the characteristics of those environments change even in a snapshot if we pause time and assess them we're going to see those changes so we need to understand at a very large scale with multiple data sets what is happening and again we need to consider what's happening at an appropriate depth below and above to make sure our comparison of what's happening at that climate event is true and we have proper context to it so our work has shown that we do actually need broader context to the sites that we're studying. It's not enough to go and study one site because you're studying one point on the landscape. We can walk across our landscapes and see that it changes. So therefore, different parts of the landscape we would expect should respond differently to the event. So what we're doing is studying multiple sites across the basin to ensure that we gain that good spatial understanding of any possible changes. We're also significantly increasing the amount of sediment we compare the climate event with. So we're, we've got about 4,000 metres of sediment now analysed um, to make sure that we have true context as to what happened before and after the event to see how significantly different the climate event was um, in terms of river characteristics. So how extreme was the change? Well, hot off the press is actually the river characteristics within the normal range of what we saw before and after the climate event. So this actually implies to us that the river didn't see any significant changes as a result of that increase in climate. So does that mean that hey, there's nothing to worry about? Well, actually, no. And for reasons I'll explain now. Rivers can absorb changes. They can kind of uh, they go through kind of a self-organization to kind of absorb any changes that are coming in. But only to a certain extent can they do that. And we call this the geomorphic threshold. So if the change is too great, we go over a geomorphic threshold and we see significant changes in the river behaviour and the characteristics. So we believe for this climate event that actually the change was over a long enough time period for the river to kind of absorb those changes. But this is a clear work in progress. And what we're trying to do at the moment is do some modelling to see using our data set, how extreme the changes, for example, in precipitation need to be to to see a big large scale response on the system. So how do we get it outside those normal conditions? So the rock record analogues, has this been useful? Well, what isn't recorded in the rocks is something that we have to consider. The rocks don't preserve everything. So we have to consider that we may actually have little bits of information missing. And that's the danger with looking into the rock record. 
The other thing is the carbon release probably took about 8,000 years, um, which is 15 times longer than any anticipated anthropogenic carbon release. That's a significant difference. And this is exactly what I was saying just on the previous slide. This is something that actually should warn us. 8,000 years, we didn't see any significant change. If we speed that up by 15 times, is that river going to significantly adjust? Well, that's what hopefully our modelling can help us see. How extreme does the change need to be in order to see a significant change in the river system behaviour and characteristics? So was the rock record useful? Because this clearly isn't a perfect analogue. They're not the same conditions. Well, that's largely because humans weren't around 56 million years ago put in the same changes. But yes, we still gained really important insights. So, for example, how systems potentially respond and how that response might be spatially variable. Also, it helps us understand the limits of response. So, Charles Lau, the present is the key to the past. Well, actually, the past is the key to the future. Although not a perfect analogue, we have gained understanding of river systems that we wouldn't have got if we hadn't undertaken these studies. So thank you very much, and I hope you've uh, been able to gain some insights in how we can look at rock record analogues, although they have their limitations, can also provide us with really important information on how we understand river systems.